Hi everyone, my name is Father John O'Brien and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, relics. Relics are kind of always with us in the Catholic faith, they're sometimes misunderstood, and uh, I'm going to try and clarify a little bit why the Church believes that relics are holy objects and are sometimes instruments or vessels of special graces. So a couple years ago, I found myself invited to do a cross-country tour of my home country, which is Canada, with a very large relic. It was the arm, uh, which is basically preserved. It's about 465 years old, uh, belonging to St. Francis Xavier, the great missionary patron of missions for the, for the whole Catholic Church. It was a relic that normally uh, resides in Rome at the Church of the Jesu, the Jesuit flagship church. And uh, this was a first for his arm to come to Canada in, in, a, in as many years as, as we, could, we could tell. The rest of Francis's body, by the way, is in Goa, India. Uh, so this had been organized by, by a, um, a group and by a Jesuit archbishop. And it had been a long time since there had been uh, a devotional tour in which major relics were being brought from city to city, place to place, for the veneration and prayer of the faithful. So it was unclear exactly how this would be received, um, what numbers of people would come out, if any. But something very interesting happened. It caught the attention of the national press, um, including the CBC, which is the large broadcaster in Canada. Now, you would think, boy, they're just going to laugh at this. Those crazy Catholics are up to their superstitious hijinks once again. Strange thing happened, though. The CBC sent their journalists to every major city where there were events happening with the arm of Francis Xavier. They largely took a respectful tone. They, they were genuinely curious to know, well, why, why are all these crowds of people coming out to pray with this almost 500-year-old arm of a Catholic saint? I often found myself having to explain why this was the case in language that both I could understand and also most certainly that the public could understand. And here's, so, here's some of the things that our, that our church uh, uses to explain devotion to relics. And uh, first of all, I would say it's, it's an intuition that the church has that grace can be mediated through tangible objects. And this is an understanding that predates our modern philosophy. Uh, such as that of Descartes, right, who famously said, I think, therefore I am. And he had a fundamental distrust of the senses, of the tangible and the visual. Okay, so we're, we're inheritors of that mindset a little bit. It also predates the Protestant Reformation, uh, in which the, um, our Protestant brothers and sisters deliberately undertook a process of having a desacramentalized focus on the word on the word. Okay. In a way, we're heirs of that too. But if we go back far enough, uh, the intuition that holy objects, especially the objects of the dead, of the saints, can be occasions of grace, it's there. And it's also pretty common to all cultures and all religions, although it finds its zenith, its fullness in Christianity. Why is that the case? Well, let's take it back. First of all, it's based upon the fundamental core truth of our religion, which is that the word became flesh, that God took on bone and blood and flesh and dwelt among us. And it was his crucified body that redeemed us. And it was his crucified body that was resurrected from the dead. So our whole sacramental system is premised or based upon an incarnational outlook. Uh, based upon that central fact. Um, and if the word became flesh, it's not so much a stretch to believe that the material or flesh can also lead us back to the word. Okay, Think of what Jesus does in his own ministry, how he uses spit, his own saliva, which he creates mud with and rubs it on the eyes of the blind man. That is the instrumentality or the the uh, medium through which healing takes place. Or think about the woman with the hemorrhage, right, who uh, has never been able to be healed through conventional means. What does she do? She sees D Jesus and she says, if I only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be, I'll, be, um, I'll be cured. And sure enough, she is. When she touches 
the hem of his garment, Jesus himself feels power go out of him. And he stops and turns and says, who touched me? There's an objective uh, transference of grace, in, this case, in these cases of healing grace, to God's people. This whole understanding of the sacramentality and the holiness of objects uh, would have been familiar to our Jewish ancestors in the faith. They knew God worked through these things. They had an Ark of the Covenant. They had a tabernacle. They had a temple. They had blood sacrifices. Um, they knew, as we inherit, the story from 2 Kings. Kings 13.20 is where we have this remarkable incident where a man has died. In fact, I'll just quote it here. As a man was being buried, a marauding band was seen and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. As soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he came to life again. That's the beginning and end of that story. It's without comment, without further comment. There's, so there's this precedent that the bones of the dead, of the holy dead, may also mediate a certain grace, a certain power. Nowadays, uh, if you go to Europe, of course, uh, it's covered with shrines filled with the bodies, the venerated bodies of our saints. It's less so here in North America. And uh, yet, even in our own day and age, we know deep down, uh, somehow we Catholics have retained this intuition that bones or particles even, pieces of the bones are, are holy and can be occasions of, of, of great blessing. Even our shrine here in Canada, in, in Midland, Ontario, uh, is centered around the veneration of the bones of one of the greatest saints of the Western Hemisphere, perhaps also of one of the greatest martyrs of church history, John de Brebeuf and the martyrs of North America. Uh, his skull his, and some of the other bones of, of him and Gabriel Lallemand and Charles Garnier, three of the Jesuit martyrs, are retained there and venerated by over 100,000 pilgrims every year. So we're not without our precedents here in North America as well. Well, my friends, I was surprised by the end of my pilgrimage uh, with the arm of Francis Xavier two years ago to find that tens of thousands of Canadian Catholics came out in all of our major cities from Toronto, Ottawa, Winnipeg, uh, through the prairies, Vancouver, Basically, everywhere it went, it overwhelmed the expectations of the local organizers. And I witnessed countless healings, countless um, conversions, and countless vocations as well emerge from this encounter with nothing more than an arm. It was an arm that had baptized, they say, uh, over 100,000 people in India. And... It was not an object of worship in itself, but merely an occasion of encounter with a piece of a saint that uh, was, was uh, a reminder of us that when we put our faith in God, miracles can happen. St. Ignatius of Loyola encourages us to venerate relics. It's right in his own writings. And why does he do that? Well, it's mainly because we need to be reminded that the whole communion of saints is active. We're all in this together, the saints of heaven and the saints on earth. And the saints in heaven, those who have gone before us, are not spending their heaven idly, but are spending it actively doing good on earth. And the veil is thin, my friends, that divides heaven and earth. So the saints are with us, and therefore our holy objects are at our disposal through the generosity of God to assist us on the way to salvation. God bless you, angels and saints of the Lord. Pray for us.